So Tatiana is out in North Carolina. She and Amy flew out there to move Amy back here. So here I am. And I'm going to speak more on biblical salvation because this continues to be a major thing that comes up in conversations with me and um, there's a lack of understanding in the people that I talk to. I've said this a few times in what exactly the Bible refers to as salvation. So I, being kind of gifted in evangelism, I have a passion to see lives radically changed for Jesus because 30 years ago, I almost went to hell. I probably nearly went to hell a few times, but that was a time where I was well aware that I was dying and so I'm very grateful to be alive and the group of people that I watch very carefully is the group that does well when they're confined so when they're in a bubble of some sort whether it's jail prison treatment some kind of transitional housing um, superstructure we do amazing we do very well when somebody else is making all the rules and making the choices but then when that structure is removed, then somehow a large percentage fall back into a more debauched life than they broke free from to begin with. And it may happen immediately, but with a lot of people, it will, it could take even a year or two, but a lot of people end up back in that group. And I don't think that anyone would ever make a choice to come to God in desperation thinking I'm going to end up worse than I am right now in a very short period of time by planning. I don't believe anyone would do that. And I've asked many along the way because I've watched this group very closely for over 20 years now. I've asked many questions about what went wrong and there's similarities that I want to speak on so that people can understand that they can come to a right and permanent safe position with God or else not be so shocked when they end up back in a worse mess than they came from. The mistakes that were made or the choices being made are rarely why they're currently now in ruins. Um, most of them, they never stopped making. They definitely never rid their thoughts of them. So a lot of people, we come to God out of desperation. It's never generally because life is going amazing. There's um, people losing kids, marriages, freedom, sanity. There's all kinds of reasons. And sadly admit, many admit that they loved their sin. They came to God, but they never abandoned their love for their sin. They never stopped loving their sin, even though they were temporarily removed from it. They never gave up their love for it. And after they were exposed to the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, they felt that their love for their sin was somehow messed up because they still kept their love for their sin. But they felt that being exposed to the truth of God's word ruined their enjoyment of it because now they were aware of the price that was gonna be paid at the end for this sin, and they knew that there was a penalty. That had never haunted them before, but now ignorance wasn't an excuse anymore. Truth tormented them, but they still chose to love their sin. They, they hung on to that. So they will say their pride, their rebellion, and their lust was costly, very costly to them. Many certainly have a desire for peace with God. We know that. We also know that God can take so many of our wrong motives, especially when we first come to him. Our motives often are still very selfish, and he can turn them into a fire that lasts for eternity, that will burn up all the selfishness, and we can become wholeheartedly his. But there's a large group that become very great at fitting into what is a religious system, and they learn how to appear to worship. They watch other people, and they are taught how to speak Christianese. 
They go to many altars. They say many sinners' prayers. They confess to being a Christian because they've been told that by many people based on the number of prayers they've prayed. And they've shown great signs of change because they're in a container that controls their behavior. So relatives are left thinking, I have my family member back, although the mind is invisible and the mind hasn't changed a lot at all. What is missing is true repentance because that has not been part of their religious system. And there's two types of repentance, attrition, which is motivated by fear of losing or fear of punishment, and contrition, which is a deep sorrow over having offended God. And many have the first type, but the second type is required for true salvation, and many are lacking that. And according to the Bible, they're not saved. And when they get out from under that protective behavior bubble, they immediately show that the Bible was indeed right about them. You take um, the group that you take your marching orders from is the group that you belong to, and what you love is who you are. And they return back to the company that was very sinful, their friends that sin, watching and listening to things that Jesus would never watch or listen to. They talk about things that they would never talk about in front of their pastor. They do things that they would never mention to the people that they met in their behavior bubble. And Billy Graham says, if you have not repented, you will not see the inside of the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, 19 to 21 says, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, which is anything you love more than God, witchcraft, which is rebellion, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. First John 3, 4 through 10 says, those who sin are opposed to the law of God, for all who sin oppose the law of God. That would mean a lifestyle or a pattern of sinning. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins, for there is no sin in him. So if we continue to live in him, we won't sin either. That means as a repeated pattern of sin. But those who keep on sinning have never known him nor understood who he is. Dear children, do not let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it is because they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy these works of the devil. Those who have been born into God's family do not sin because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning because they have been born of God. So now we can tell who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Anyone who does not obey God's commands and does not love other Christians does not belong to God. That is what the Bible says. And repentance is not a bad word. It's not the voice of an angry pastor waving a Bible, spewing condemnation at people walking by. It's not legalism. It is not a demand of controlling an angry leaders or of an angry or controlling God. It, uh, the call to repentance is God's merciful invitation to be forgiven, to change our ways, to be healed by him, and to escape the ravaging power of sin. It is God's very extravagant, kind insistence that our sin does not have the last word, that we are not doomed to remain in them. Repentance is a way out of our sin. And we must understand what repentance is. It is not just a change of behavior. It is a radical change of behavior. Repentance is a total reshaping of your thoughts and your lifestyle so that it centers on Jesus Christ. Genuine repentance is not as much a matter of turning from sin as turning to Jesus completely. He says in Isaiah 45, 22, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is no other. If repentance were always about making those 180 U-turns, then it would only apply to people like us who are just flagrant 
out here sinning like crazy, moving in the opposite direction of Jesus. But it would have no relevance for those who walk with the Lord, aim to please him, but get slightly off course. When we realize repentance is less about turning from sin as turning to Jesus, then we know that at any time the Spirit will convict us of even the most subtle sin, even if we're a tiny little bit off, maybe an attitude or a mindset, which often happens, and we get out of sync with the Holy Spirit, we are again brought to a recalibration by repentance, which comes from the Holy Spirit, so that we are aligned with Christ. And this is very important to understand. Many have prolonged their misery by focusing on the wrong thing. They dwell on failures, shortcomings. They beat themselves up. They live under condemnation and shame. I'll never overcome this issue. They get stuck on all about their addiction, all about whatever it is. I'll never be able to live like a true Christian. When time and time again, they try to turn away from the sin. They get no victory. They just have guilt, shame, and unworthiness when it was never about the sin. It was about turning to Jesus, not about being obsessed with the sin. And that's been the problem, is people are just constantly brought to reality of their sin versus this is about turning towards Jesus. When we turn from sin to Jesus Christ, everything changes. Jesus is the beauty of holiness. Revelation 1, 12 through 20. Jesus is our magnificent obsession. Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit who empowers us to live victoriously. Jesus is a great high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses, helps us when we're tempted. Jesus is our life. And rather than thinking about how much we failed him, we need to focus on him completely. And that's what repentance is. So when you find yourself wrecked by sin, rebellion, disobedience, you put your eyes back on Jesus turn to him with your whole heart and you move in the direction of Christ and you will find your way out. Sin banishes you from the presence of God. So if you're constantly looking at your sin and I got to stop sinning, I got to stop sinning. It's like people who go to various support groups and keep confessing to being that thing. They're going to stay obsessed with that as their identity. They're going to stay trapped in it. Keep focusing on Jesus Christ. Those who fell did not see their sin as repulsive. And if they did, they would have never returned to it. They were not free from it. They still loved it. They stayed attached to it. They stayed dwelling on it. They stayed thinking on it. They stayed lusting on it. And after they fell, many admit their focus was never on Jesus, but intermittently, they stayed mostly focused on serving self and fulfilling what self wanted. Jesus was the intermittent, fleeting thing in the middle. A divine encounter with God during a genuine salvation experience gives you an entirely different set of marching orders. And because inner desires never changed with many of these people, they now see that they never came to true repentance. And true repentance is not confessing, sinning, confessing, sinning, confessing, and then giving up. Confession that is genuine means you completely turn away from it. Confession without obedience is a complete lie. Wickedness, put Jesus on the cross, real repentance requires that after you confess, you submit to God, you resist that sin from that point on. If you're addicted to internet sin, you block the internet. If you are addicted to sexual sin, you will recognize your body no longer belongs to you, it belongs to Jesus Christ. He will not stay in a body that is constantly being used as a playground for the enemy. If gossip and complaining frequently pours from your mouth, you still need to surrender to Jesus. God makes a clear statement through the whole Bible that he hates both of those things and he'll stay as far from you as you continue to do those things. If you want Jesus in your life, you're going to partner with the Holy Spirit. You will do whatever it takes to stop sinning. And if not, you will never know him. You'll never know anything but a feeling of emptiness and turmoil because true repentance allows God to literally break your heart towards sin where he turns you inside out by piercing you and you see the cost of your sin to himself that he was murdered 
to pay for that sin. It had a huge price. It cost Jesus everything. So you cannot claim to love him and belong to him and continue sinning. We must want the repentance that makes us sick if we ever sin against God again willfully. The repentance that causes us to hate what the Bible calls wickedness. And that's the piece that's often missing in this group. This will be what separates those who will make it to heaven and those who are still choosing to go to hell. Jonathan Edwards is famous for writing pieces such as his sermon to what he called professing Christians. When he would speak, people would literally hang on to the pillars of the church. He spoke to the many who profess Christ, but they show no possession of Christ. They enter into a religious system of pretending to be a Christian, and they appear to most people to be a genuine Christian. But he warns of the ultimate peril of this group, because not only are they not saved, they are practicing blasphemy against God by entering into what is holy while refusing to come to him in the way that he requires. True sorrow for sin is practical. No man can say he hates sin if he continues to live in it. Repentance makes us see the evil of sin. We will shun it in every way, not in great things only, but in the little things. Sincere repentance is continual. Believers repent until their dying day. This is not intermittent. Sin would not be attractive if the wages were paid immediately because then we would know how costly it was. Romans 2, 4 through 11 says, Do you not realize how kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Or don't you care? Can't you see how kind he has been in giving you time to turn from your sin? But no, you won't listen. So you're storing up terrible punishment for yourself because of your stubbornness in refusing to turn from your sin. For there is going to come a day of judgment when God, the just judge of all the world, will judge all people according to what they have done. He will give eternal life to those who persist in doing good, seeking after the glory, honor, and immortality that God offers. But he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey the truth and practice evil deeds. There will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on sinning, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. But there will be glory and honor and peace from God for all who do good, for the Jew first and also the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. Matthew 23, 27 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Genuine salvation will show up all over in your life. When I was lost in sin, it was not hard for me to tell who the real Christians were when I needed help, and it wasn't because of what they said. And trust me, there was many in the clubs where I was that were telling me that they were Christians, but there was absolutely nothing different in how they lived their lives than how I lived my lives, which is why I had no respect for God. I could tell by the way that the real ones talked how they acted, and actually what they avoided, what they weren't willing to do with the rest of us. A true believer in Jesus Christ honors Jesus even when he thinks no one is watching because it shows up in your character. People can sense the presence of God all over you. Marty Zander Zanden, he's actually from the metro area, wrote a book called They Say You're Saved, What If They're Wrong? There's about 50 verses, he says, in this book about how to gain entrance into heaven, but not one of them says anything about saying a prayer. A prayer is an awesome way to start, but not at all the way that God talks about being saved. Getting into heaven is not about saying a prayer or earning our salvation or doing any kind of works to get us to heaven. It's about developing an intimate relationship with and having faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus expects us to turn from sin. That means Repentance is turning from our sin, turning our wills and our lives over to his care. That's lordship. He's Lord or he's not anything. When we do this, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's not the end. It's just the beginning. When you have the Holy Spirit, Jesus expects us to use the gifts that he gives us at that point to batter hell. He expects us to follow him, love others, serve others, and teach others about him and to love God with all of our heart, mind, 
body, and soul. And one of the greatest deceptions pulled off by Satan is to convince the church and many Christian leaders that all we have to do is authentically say a sinner's prayer to gain entrance into heaven. That is not in the Bible. More is required. The definition of believe is critical. We need to know how Jesus defined it. If we believe in Jesus, we will be living as if we believe. If we don't, we won't be living as if we believe. And this is not casual belief that Jesus is calling us to. He's first or he's nothing. He wants to be before our spouse, our parents, our children. He wants to be first by a far measure. And our relationship to him has to be our top priority. This isn't about selling everything. This is about giving up our lives entirely as we know them and letting him determine what we do with the rest of our lives. Jesus himself said the consequences of not developing this personal intimacy with him will prevent us from going to heaven. Matthew 7, 21 to 23 says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. Only those who do the will of his Father in heaven will enter heaven. And it does say that that's not a very big group. So the mass of people born on this earth will not be going to heaven according to Jesus. On Judgment Day, verse 22 says, Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. If we aren't walking the narrow path after entering through the narrow gate, we are in great danger. And Jesus says that risk is very high. Colossians 3, 5 through 10 says, So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these things, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but now is a time to rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all of its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. That is from Colossians 3, 5 through 10. Jesus paid with his life to have this relationship. He definitely did his part. We have got to be willing to do ours to be able to participate in this. Back in the days of Noah, according to the Bible, people did not have God as the center of their lives. They were going about their day, the Bible says, eating, drinking, marrying, and then it was too late. That's what the Bible says. And then suddenly it was too late. They were about their own business instead of God's business. And the consequence of that was they were swept away. And that's what happens with most people. I just got the call um, last night when I was here, but this morning got more details where I had a relative who was just, who suddenly died. And I think all of us have had those calls where we just have someone that we know who just suddenly dies. And had they known that, I think many things would have been different. And the spouse of this relative asked my mother, said, will you please say a prayer that they got to where they needed to go? And that's a really hard thing to hear. Because once they're dead, there's nothing to be done. There's no, no one can do anything at that point. The judgment Jesus speaks of is based on whether people were, while on earth, serving others, and while doing so, developing their relationship with Jesus Christ. And those who didn't serve Jesus by serving others clearly didn't have a relationship with him, since that's what he requires. The consequence of their lack of faith in action is going to be hell. When Jesus returns, which will be any day now, those of we were just talking about that prior to this, it's... um. I've never, I'm not one, obviously we don't know the day or the hour, but the prophecy is being fulfilled faster than I've ever seen it. Jesus 
will expect his followers to be acting on their salvation and furthering his kingdom on earth. That's the one requirement that he said would come with those who were genuinely his. They would understand that without them, others are going to go to hell. We have to save those around us. We aren't saving them. We're bringing them to Jesus to be saved. Pastor Richard Stagg, who was often out in the jails with me, a great mentor in the jails, he would tell me if you're not it would tell everyone in the jails, if you're not eagerly watching for Jesus to return, he's not coming for you. We can't let our faith grow cold. We must stand firm until the end. It's not about the tasks that gain you salvation. It's about being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Your heart is passionate when his life is in you and you are doing the things that he leads you to do out of the overflow of your hearts because they are full of the Holy Spirit, meaning you have moved out the world and given way to the Holy Spirit. And the reward of living this way is eternity in heaven with Jesus. The punishment for not doing this is eternity with Satan in hell. Hell was not created for us. It was created for Satan. But choosing to live for self is choosing to align with Satan. It is indescribably good to turn away from a life of sin and turn to Jesus, accept him as Lord, receive him and his gift, the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus refers to as being born again. If you compare the statistics of Christians who attend church and statistics of good and moral non-believers, the divorce rate is the same, the abortion rate is the same, the addiction rate is the same, The type of music is the same. The activities are the same. But I guarantee you this is not what Jesus meant when he said we would look radically different from the world. Something is wrong with the church today when people can't tell who's who. How can one be filled with the power that raised Jesus from the dead and look the same as someone who does not even know Jesus? It's not possible. It is simply not even possible. The gospel being preached today in America is a complete lie. Many of today's pastors are not even believers themselves. When I was in the jails, the men in jail would tell me that they would watch the televangelists and they said, these men are no different than drug dealers. They said they peddle Jesus for money just like we do drugs. They have the same character, they feel the same. They would say we watch them and laugh because they're the same as us. And they reported that many ministries that they've encountered, they feel are the same spirit as themselves. The sad thing is, if men and women sitting in jail can discern this, and they're not even claiming to be born again, Jesus definitely knows the difference better than they do. I would challenge people, what kind of movies do you watch? Would Jesus be watching those things? What kind of language do you use? Would you use that language with Jesus in a conversation? We watch how people worship musicians and athletes, how sports gets people so invigorated. The same people who don't want people being brazen about their faith in Jesus Christ are loud and incredibly loud about their sports teams. God is very aware of that. If we're true Christians who follow Jesus, we will be new creations. We will not conform to the world around us. We will be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in our hearts. We will die to sin in our lives and we will choose to glorify God. Jesus never called us to be good. He called us to be holy. He called us to be his. And if we are his, We will clearly show this in our lives and in our choices, and we will not look like the rest of the world. We will stand out and we will be different, whatever that costs us. We may have years of poor behavior, sin and disobedience. I am one of those people, but the process of transformation and sanctification definitely removes that. It makes us aware of, I live in grace. I marvel that I was saved. I live grateful every day that God chose me to save out of all the people I know. I don't deserve Jesus. I don't deserve to be saved. Um, So many people around me I felt were better people than me. 
it's, it's baffling why God chose to save me, but I live in awe of him. I live wanting to please him. I don't want to hurt him. I don't know why he chose me. I love him. If we love him, our heart will become filled with desires that fill the heart of Jesus, and some are, to be one with the Father, to love others well, to live as a living sacrifice, to live as a servant to all, to pray, to be in the word, to feed the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in you, and to feed those who hunger, and to clothe the poor. Statistics say that most people in America claim to be Christian, and they base this transaction on a sinner's prayer. They do not give regard to what happens after this prayer because no one tells them anything but that, just to say this prayer and you've entered the kingdom. Biggest lie. That is one of the biggest lies that has ever been spread from hell. The Bible says in James 2, 14, 14 through 19, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it in your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see your brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. So if you are a genuine follower, you will act like one. Jesus will be your main focus and his choices will be your choices. And if this isn't true about you, you're going to want to ask yourself if you really have faith in Jesus Christ and if you are a follower of his because if this isn't true about you, there's deception somewhere. You are either a follower of Jesus or you're following your own thoughts. And the following your own thoughts and your own desires aligns with Satan. Jesus does not guarantee a life with houses and riches. He never promised us anything here about persecution. He guaranteed that we would see trouble, but that we would have peace and we would overcome. That's what he said. Keep your relationship with Jesus your top priority. Follow him in all of his ways. Love him and others. Serve him and others. And turn from your sinful choices and live in the light. That's what he says to do. And I'm desperate to help you figure out which side you're on so that you can deal with this now instead of paying with your life or worse, eternity later. Because I have witnessed many who have been throttled into eternity suddenly and we're all left standing there going, I didn't see that coming. And all of us wonder, where are they? It's a very scary thing to have happen. And there's nothing you can do at that point. And sadly, there are many who are very unwilling to repent of their sin, and they are not willing to cry out to God for help at this moment. They'd rather wait for another crisis, and they'll never get that crisis. Many won't get it again. And this is not a cry to receive limited relief, which will only lead back to sin and oppression. The cry that God hears is to be totally released from sin, wanting to be rid of all idols, which are anything that matter to you more than God, wanting to turn your heart and life totally over to God, God is looking for a life of this desperation, not a season of desperation. And sadly, that's the case of many. They had a season of desperation. And once the season passes, then they go back. And if we have a length of time required for this change to happen and our hearts are not broken enough to draw the attention of God because we're just looking for him to suddenly show up, help me re relieve my suffering for a minute. Many that I see are very fervent in their prayers and it all sounds good until God doesn't come through and give them what they wanted, the, re the result that they were expecting. They wanted their um, significant other to not leave them. They wanted something, but suddenly when that doesn't happen. They're not so passionate about God. He's not um, serving them the way that they want to be served. So they return back to using their own methods and people to serve them. They love God as long as he serves them. But when he sits and waits for them to serve him, they get tired of that and they fall away. They want shortcuts instead of his perfect will for them. What they don't seem to understand is how great their sin is before God. 
they think they have sinned against man, but they don't see it like David did. I've sinned against you, and against you only I have sinned. And that is the humility that comes with the acknowledgement that God wants to see, and he will move heaven and earth on your behalf with that kind of brokenness. Statistics show over an 80% rate of failure among those who respond for salvation at altar calls, having prayed that sinner's prayer that's so popular in American churches. I do not want any under my voice to ever fall into that sad 80% number that still believe they're going to heaven and they are not giving it another thought because someone pronounced them saved. What they may have is a good social life among the church. They might even be rid of a few bad behaviors, but what they lack is what the Bible says must be present for salvation. Every pastor loves to get decisions, but if those decisions don't produce converts who bear fruit accompanying repentance, the Bible says they are going to be cast out. The Bible says that every tree that doesn't bring forth good fruit is going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. George Whitfield said the reason we have so many mushroom converts is because their stony ground is not even plowed up. They have no real conviction of their sin against God, their stony ground hears. And these converts produce what appears to be instant excitement and fruit, but as soon as hard times come, or great times come, they fall away. They go about establishing their own form of righteousness, remaining ignorant of what God calls righteousness, and they believe that they're going to heaven. 62% of Americans believe in hell, but they don't think they're going there. And why? They say they're too good to go to hell. And the statistics that say that in many Christian denominations today, over half of the church, Protestant churches, don't even believe there's a literal hell. They just think that sinners will be destroyed. But hell is very real. It was not created for humans. It was created for the devil and his angels. And Jesus begs us through the entire New Testament to not go to hell. He says it is eternal, it's real, and it's terrible. Jesus says that. You don't want to go there. Jesus spoke of hell all the time. If you don't believe in hell, then Jesus is a liar and you don't know him. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. He's able to save to the uttermost them that come to God by him. Jude 1.24 says he's able to keep them from falling and present them faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. A genuine believer will stand through any amount, any amount of adversity. The Israelites were in bondage to Egypt. God's chosen people were miraculous deliver, miraculously delivered from slavery and promised a land flowing with milk and honey, but they never went to possess that promised land and they died in the wilderness. And many are doing that today. If a convert is genuine, he is going to continue to grow through all of the hardship. If he's false, he's going to wither and die. The thing lacking in that one is that he has no zeal for the loss, meaning he doesn't care that there's loss going, there's people dying all around that probably are not going to heaven. He doesn't care. He's a stranger to holiness, doesn't even know what it means, doesn't even care to look at what it means, even though it's required. He has no hunger for the word. He has no depth to his prayer life. Jesus said, if a new convert even looks back, he's not fit for the kingdom, Luke 9, 62. So you need to ask yourself, are you truly saved? There's a second group that I want to address, and this group does bear the fruit of salvation. There's no question that they have a real relationship with the Most High. However, for some reason, they chose to return to a lifestyle of sin. And most tell me that started with a relationship. I regret how many today, it's pornography. It'll cost them everything. It'll cost them everything. And they won't stop. And there's ways to stop. Accountability is a great way to stop any sin. This is why I believe in building a community because you can't do it by yourself. But if you have sisters around you who love you, and care about you and won't berate you, then you have usually one for whatever it is that's going on that you can say, 
every day, please ask me if I've done that again, because I don't want to do that again. I'll end up in hell if I don't stop. But for most who showed that they had, and sadly, they will go along for a great long period of time, and they'll often even show um, they could build a big ministry, and then you see that tremendous fall into immorality. They didn't intend for it to become a sexual, widely known, big problem in their life. They dabbled. They played with something. They looked at something. They wanted attention. They wanted adoration. Started as an emotional affair. They just wanted somebody to pay attention. But the thing is, God took his hand of protection off of them with that disobedience, and then all hell appears to break loose in their life. And I regret how many fall into that group. I've watched it so many times that it's always tragic to watch because the family, the entire family, and many times the ministry are destroyed. We do see it in the news often. If it were any other person, it wouldn't be splashed all over the news, but because they were high up with God as the world perceived it, then it becomes a major world story. And they're just brought to worldwide exposure. They'll tell you that the cost of returning to this sin was their life. It was everything. And some have even died. God is very jealous. Anthony spoke on this last night. God is very jealous, and he has a right to be jealous. He gave up his son for us. He has a right to be jealous. And he is not going to let those who became sons and daughters go back to a pig pen and mock him, still claiming his name over their lives. He will let the consequences of your choices run you down and overtake you. I've had that happen to me. It's absolutely so frightening to me now that it's frightening to me how fast that can happen. There are strong verses to support this. Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 19 says, See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commands, decrees, and laws, then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, which often is self-gratification, self-indulgence, often immorality is the main one, or greed, love of money and power, those are probably the main ones, Believe it or not, unforgiveness and anger, too, are in that list. Somebody is just so angry and unforgiving, they won't let it go. I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. That's really important because the kids reap the whirlwind of the choices of the parents. A lot of, yeah, we, we all know that. Deuteronomy 28, 20, the Lord will send on you curses, confusion, and rebuke in everything you put your hand to until you are destroyed and come to sudden ruin because of the evil you have done in forsaking him. Luke 6, 46 to 49, so why do you call me Lord when you won't obey me? I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then obeys me. It is like a person who builds a house on a strong foundation, laid upon an underlying rock. When the flood waters rise and break against the house, it stands firm because it is well built. But anyone who listens and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will crumble into a heap of ruins. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. Joshua 23, 16, if you break the covenant of the Lord your God by worshiping and serving other gods, his anger will burn against you and you will quickly be wiped out from the good land he has given you. Ephesians 5, 3 through 9, 
but among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. You can choose to be the Christian who belongs to God's family, knows of God's claims upon him, hears his call, but does not respond. This Christian remains in his choice of living when God has asked him first, Seek the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33. But here's what's happening. The music of making money, applause of man, the opinion of family, opinion of friends, deafen many to the call of the living God. And look at the wreckage of the lives where people have chosen the wrong priority, which is any of those things. Money, applause, Fear of man is a huge one, not wanting to lose people. And some of the saddest people have been those who did not keep their eyes on God and things went terribly wrong in the end, and they knew it. Their success turned to ashes, their popularity was lost. They chose opportunities of the world and they let others follow Christ to the harvest field, to the battlefield, and to the mission field. And in the end, they had nothing absolutely nothing and they knew that they had passed up the call God moved over them I think it was someone who told me Billy Graham said when someone said how does it feel to be chosen to be Billy Graham and he said something like God chose him you were number three the first two refused the call you were the third choice I don't ever want to hear that that I missed because I was so self-absorbed, that can happen. I, I have been there. I urge you to never consider a willful choice to compromise the cross of Jesus Christ. Not once has he ever compromised us. You may spend the remainder of your earthly life paying the price. Many have. The love and mercy of our Heavenly Father will not allow us to thrive in wickedness. He bought us at a great price, and he's determined to have us for all of eternity. He will stop at nothing. And this is mercy. He will do whatever it takes to keep you out of hell. He will stop at nothing to accomplish that, even if it means keeping you confined. And many are sitting in prison knowing that if they weren't there, they would probably be in hell. They recognize that their inability or refusal to be obedient has them confined and that's God's mercy for them please don't choose that destiny that is not his perfect will for you it's the result of your choices to abandon obedience to him our salvation was a free gift while it cost Jesus everything all his blood it cost us nothing salvation did not cost us that however to be a disciple of Christ is going to cost us our life Getting rid of the old self was God's responsibility, but making the flesh and its deeds inoperable, that is our responsibility. God changed our nature. We have to change our behavior. And if the love of God is ruling in you, it will destroy all the works of the devil. For if you want to save your own life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will save it. Luke 9.24 I have a sign on my wall that says, Dying for me was the most he could do. Living for him is the least I can do. And nobody likes their own death, but we behave like spoiled children. This religion in America has taught us prosperity, prosperity, prosperity. Name it, ask, you'll receive it. There is absolutely nothing in the gospel that supports that. 
It is time to decide whether or not we will serve him. That is what it supports. And this means we nail our personal rights, our selfish desires, our pride, our anger, our worldly passions, our personal dreams to the cross so that God will fulfill his dreams in our lives. He gives us new desires. If we understood and knew Jesus Christ, we really completely, really understood him, we would fall on our face. True salvation doesn't mean praying to make a decision for Christ or accepting Jesus into my heart. It means repenting of sin and vowing to make every decision from now on for Jesus Christ. And that is the salvation that will take you to heaven. Satan's greatest lie, the one that has pretty much filled hell is, you have plenty of time to get right with God. The devil is not anti-religion, he is anti-Jesus Christ. Satan has created many religions, powerless Christianity, in order to blind people to the truth of God's true gospel. Your life as a Christian should make non-believers around you question their disbelief in God or their resistance to truly being born again. And if this isn't your story, you need to settle this with God before it's too late. Don't give the devil one more minute of your life. Precious Lord, thank you for every single breath that you have given me past what I deserve because I definitely earned hell and I, I marvel that you have given me life and eternal life. And I pray for your protection over every single person that hears this message and I ask that you would bring a great harvest to this earth, to our city. We want revival, Jesus. We want to plunder hell and build heaven. Help us, God, to be faithful. Help us to rid our lives of all of the idols and all of the things that keep robbing us of you. You are the only one who deserves our worship. Help us, Jesus to be faithful. And I ask this in your precious name. Amen.